Smartphone owners will have added protection against theft, and we say goodbye to another longtime legislator in this week's Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. The last full week of the legislative session was pretty much business as usual, with the activity centered on floor debates and conference committees and the passage of dozens of bills. Now, one of those we featured early in session right here on Capitol Report. It affects anybody with a cell phone, particularly a smartphone. The governor recently signed into law the kill switch legislation, and we caught up with Representative Joe Atkins for reaction to the passage of his legislation. It was a bill you were very optimistic about, but yet you had some concerns at the beginning of session whether or not you could get providers on board. How did it all unfold? Well, and it was nice at the end that we actually got the providers on board in terms of being supportive of the language. They still don't like the idea that a state would, uh, would create a law with respect to it. But there's been an epidemic of smartphone thefts. In fact, one out of every three robberies in Minnesota and across the country is now as a result of a smartphone theft. And they're becoming increasingly violent, so we had to do something. Signed into law. Has to feel good? It feels great. And uh, even better is we had the police chief from the U, students from the U, all talking about what a big difference it's going to make there, but also all across Minnesota. A bonding bill that uses $846 million in GO bonds and $200 million in cash was agreed upon late Wednesday afternoon. Senator Leroy Stumpf caught up with us after the agreement was announced to provide his perspective. The agreement is uh, one that we worked out <clears throat> in conjunction with the governor's office and uh, as well as uh, Republicans in both House and Senate. And uh, even though we may not have total um, a hundred percent agreement on from the part of all on the part of all legislators. I think we have uh, covered uh, a good base of, of uh, legislators across the state. And one of the things that we tried very hard on the Senate side is to look at um, the uh, uh, kind of the ba the core needs of our state. Uh, we had zeroed in on the Senate side, and, and a lot of these things are in that, that agreement. Housing. We, we saw from last September in our tour around the state that the, the need of many, many communities all over the state for housing, additional housing, was very high. Uh, we have in that agreement $100 million, actually it's $106 million if you count the uh, Dorothy Day Center. and. Uh, that is the highest amount of money that we have uh, allocated toward housing ever in a, a Minnesota bonding bill. Um, the, another area that was very important was the higher education. When we went around and visited our college campuses and, and talked to employers and talked to uh, instructors, we found that there is a huge need for trained employees across the state of Minnesota. And so we tried very hard in the bonding bill to adequately uh, put resources into uh, the uh, higher education system so that they can change the programs, uh, uh, identify those areas where they want to increase uh, program uh, capacity, such as uh, a lot of the trades like welding and, and uh, uh, a lot of the technician type programs that are highly, those students are highly sought after. Um, we also uh, work closely with the governor in economic development and uh, the infrastructure needed for the economic development, such as you, you have uh, uh, adequate transportation um, uh, for, for a company to come in and, and such as the, the uh, old army, army ammunition uh, site uh, north of uh, St. Paul. Uh, we also had um, uh, tried to identify those kinds of projects that would give uh, a, a boost to, to uh, employers. So Senator, was there a position that the Senate had hoped for a project that ended up being removed from the bill? Something well, I, that you consider a priority? Well, certainly I, th I think um, we uh, fell uh, a little bit short on funding for the Dorothy Day Center. Um, and uh, I've talked to them. Uh, they had requested uh, uh, starting out $15 million, and this is really to try to address the, the large number of homeless people 
that aren't really residents of St. Paul, but are, are really come from all over the state and even outside the state. So we we ended up uh, funding that project at six million, and so uh, uh, it's going to take um, a lot of uh, ingenuity and, and creativity, as well as probably some additional funding from wherever, to uh, make that project work. My last question for you is: Representative Hausman made no bones about the fact that she thought 846 was too low. Were you okay with that number, or did you think the bonding bill should have been higher? Well, we really didn't have a choice in that because that was a, a number that was basically uh, kind of the size of the box that was given to us, and we had to work within that box. And I think um, uh, that probably was the first time a bonding committee really ever had that type of an approach. Um, usually there's a little bit of a leeway, a give, and uh, apart from the 846, we did have some cash, $200 million in cash, but uh, it's still... When you look at the, the backlog of projects and you look at the size of those projects, such as the convention centers across the state and uh, the, the tremendous ba um, uh, need for our state institutions, such as the security hospital and the, and the corrections uh, facilities that have been left unfixed for a long, long, long time. Those projects really took, and the capital too, I can't uh, forget to mention that. That's a very, very large project. So in a sense, what this bonding bill does is kind of push off, take care of a lot of those projects and opens the door for uh, in, a, in two years for uh, kind of a fresh start. And you mentioned in two years, however, traditionally, lately anyway, there's been a bonding bill every year. Do you foresee one next year? Uh, yes, I think uh, that's, that's correct. Uh, usually there's a, a number of, of areas that uh, can be addressed and uh, one that comes to mind personally is the flood mitigation. Uh, you never know. Uh, all it takes is, a, is a, uh, an incident where you have a disaster and, and you really realize that uh, the, the importance of trying to take care of the, uh, the, you know, those communities that protect those communities that are flooding. The bonding bill does not include a provision that the governor said would have sealed its fate. The bonding bill has a provision in the, from the Senate side that would uh, eliminate the rulemaking uh, and create uh, that requires uh, sprinklers in houses new homes above a certain size. The house uh, does not contain that provision. That provision has no business being in a bonding bill. It's, uh, it's unrelated to, to the bill, and it's just an attempt to force me to uh, accept something that I vetoed both in 2011 and 2012, 13, 12? 12, so I will veto the bonding bill if it has this provision in it. They, they can just know that right now. They can put whatever they want in that bonding bill, and much as I want a bonding bill, I will not have something rammed down my throat. So they uh, would be well advised to, take, to leave that out. If they want to put it in, a, in another bill. It's in a couple other bills, I'm told. As a policy matter, that's perfectly legitimate. But uh, to, try to try to ram it through on, on a bonding bill is just really uh, out of line and unacceptable. The public will have a chance to weigh in on who should set the salaries for legislators. The 2016 ballot will include the question of whether a commission should be in charge of that task. This legislative session, the discussion narrowed down who can serve on that commission. This bill actually is a, a bill that passed last year, uh, the constitutional amendment to remove uh, lawmakers' power to set their own pay and to turn it over to an independent citizens only council. Uh, the reason that it's before us now, uh, again, is because last year we passed the bill, but we did not put a title on it. And constitutional amendments require a title. And for that reason, uh, we uh, have a title that's been placed on it. The title is Remove Lawmakers' Power uh, to Set Their Own Pay. Um, it also adds more restrictions. I already mentioned what the House had added on top of what we did. Uh, but the bill that we passed last year did have restrictions on 
uh, legislators and former legislators and lobbyists and former lobbyists saying that they could not serve. We have added to that as well. I think, quite frankly, that the title is, is not truly representative of, of the nature of the bill itself. It talks about removing the legislator's power to set their own pay. And I understand that technically that probably is, is correct. However, what it does is it, it instills in the minds of the people, ha ha, we can finally take care of this issue. But the reality of it is, as we look at the legislation, what we created last year was pretty much a backhanded way to get us a pay raise in the long run anyway. If we think we need a raise, we ought to stand up, <clears throat> say we do, push a green button and and make it happen. But until that time, uh, I don't think we ought to give this responsibility over to an outside group. Uh, let's uh, be responsible for our own salaries. Let's vote on those salaries. In fact, if we want uh, an increase, or for that matter, a decrease, but uh, that responsibility ought to, ought to rest right here with the legislature, not an outside body. I'm talking to you about a gaping hole. Maybe it wasn't thought of in committee. Maybe other states haven't thought of this. But Senator Eakin, like we do with some of our administrative and uh, judicial branch and the PUC, let's impose ex parte contact rules so nobody that's going to benefit or potentially uh, be affected by the outcome of the decision has a right or will have any influence on the council while they're deliberating over a decision that would either raise or decrease legislative pay. It's a constitutional amendment that's going to be on the ballot in 2016 and the people will be able to decide whether to remove lawmakers' ability or power to set their own pay. And that's the, the title that we chose for it is to remove lawmakers' power to set their own pay and to turn it over to an independent citizens-only council. And as you said, it's a very tight council. We've removed all conflict of interest. That's the whole reason for this amendment is to remove that conflict of interest. Uh, when it comes to, to legislative pay, uh, we need to look at objectivity, and we are not objective when it comes to setting our own pay. Uh, and that's the reason that this should be removed to an independent, objective citizens' council. There will be no lawmakers serving on it, no former lawmakers serving on it. There will be no spouses of lawmakers serving on it, no lobbyists or former lobbyists serving on it. There will be no constitutional officers serving on it, including the governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, state auditor, and so on. Uh, there will be uh, no judges serving on it. Anybody who has a close relationship with the legislature is removed. Anybody whose pay depends on the legislature is removed. Um, there's not even any legislative appointees on this Citizens Council. It's all very tight, and we've removed every possible conflict of interest that we can think of. And that brought up an interesting point on the floor. Senator Tory Westrom brought up the issue of lawmakers or lobbyists potentially whining and dining members of this commission. Do you sense that there could be a conflict of interest in that way, or, or how do you try to mitigate these concerns? Well, we accepted Senator Westrom's amendment, uh, so we tightened it up even further yet, uh, so that there would be no communication whatsoever between lawmakers and those on the Citizens Council making determinations and decisions about the pay. Uh, so that, too, is also included now. So, again, we're making this as tight as we possibly can. Uh, if there's any other further concerns in the future, we can certainly address that legislatively with further restrictions as well. Uh, but I think we've, uh, we've developed a Citizens Council here that's as tight and it's as free of conflict of interest as, as, as any commission of this nature in the nation. How would they evaluate the success or not no success of this? Well, I think it's been very successful. Uh, we've seen that they've been very independent and, uh, and, and they've actually seen situations where a couple of situations where the pay has been cut or the pay has not been raised. You know, so uh, they are very independent of the lawmakers. And, and again, that's the whole reason for doing this. Our constituents did not send us down here uh, to debate and spend time arguing about what our pay should be. Uh, we were sent here to deal with our constituents' concerns, not our own pay. And so that's why we've uh, introduced this constitutional amendment. I do believe uh, that it's very popular. I've, uh, I've talked to many people about it uh, on the campaign trail. Uh, I've also had many people that have approached me that know that I've been carrying this. They were very uh, supportive of it. And uh, many who do feel that it is just a, a glaring conflict of interest that's embedded in our Constitution right now that needs to be removed. 
Working under the assumption that voters approved this measure in 2016, you know, you're putting a lot in the hands of the public when public opinion of lawmakers in general isn't really high right now. Is there any concern that there might be some backlash and pay could be reduced by people who maybe don't understand the inner workings of what happens here? Well, it's a possibility, and uh, you know, but again, that shouldn't be uh, something that, that I'm spending my time thinking about or working on. Uh, my concern is with, uh, you know, it's not our pay, but I've been more concerned about the pay of, for instance, uh, uh, personal care attendants and long-term care workers and nursing home workers and, and things of that nature who haven't seen pay increases in many years. Uh, and that's what we should be focusing our time on. And so I'm not so concerned what the Citizens Council will do. I believe that they will do a good job of, of uh, I guess, coming forward with an objective proposal or uh, a pay level uh, because part of their job is to study what it is that we do, what the time commitment is, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, how we compare with other states in terms of uh, uh, our workload. Uh, so they're going to be looking at other states too and what they're doing. So I think that in the end they're going to make a very good decision um, and uh, I, I think it's going to be better than anything we can do. Uh, because they're not getting any direct benefit from it, so they're going to be looking at it objectively. On Thursday, lawmakers announced an agreement on the medical marijuana bill. Legislative leaders unveiled those details in a news conference. It is based uh, on the, the House bill, kind of as the template, uh, making use of the patient registry model. The means by which folks have access is by signing up through a patient registry in which uh, then uh, data and information around the utility and efficacy uh, of medical cannabis can be gleaned. Um, folks have access to what they need at a number of sites around the state, uh, eight sites. Um, the, the conditions by which uh, folks uh, qualify um, continues to be by virtue of a, of a diagnosis, uh, the list of, of diagnoses that are contained in the House bill. Um, in the instance of cancer, um, if folks have uh, chronic or severe pain, chronic or severe wasting, or chronic and severe nausea, we also add the ability for folks with terminal Ill illnesses with those same symptoms um, having access to, to medical cannabis. My daughter Amelia is eight years old and she is battling Dravet syndrome. What that means for Amelia is she's having 30 to 50 seizures a day. When we started this process in January, having Carly Moline and Erin Murphy come to our house and tell our story, I never thought I would be standing here today. This means the world to our family. This is going to change my daughter's life and thousands of lives in Minnesota. I cannot thank Senator Dibble and Representative Moline enough for taking this on this session. For the governor's office and staff to be willing to compromise is amazing. This is so important to us and our family. We continue our conversations with representatives who are stepping down with Representative Mary Liz Holberg. Thanks for joining us this week. My pleasure. Let's talk first of all about when you were elected. It's roughly 20 years ago. What made you decide to even run for office? What was compelling about public office? Well, I was serving as a city council member for the city of Lakeville at the time and enjoying that. My youngest child was uh, eight and so was in school full time and the seat became open because of a judicial appointment. It sounded interesting. Uh, I talked with the incumbents, uh, Representative Macklin. Um, he talked about uh, how fun it was, and I, I thought it would be a good way to get involved in the community and asked him about the time commitment, et cetera. Interestingly enough, when I saw him six, eight months later after I'd been here a couple months, and I mentioned that discussion that we had, and. I said, you know, those things that you told me, I think you maybe weren't completely honest with me. And he laughed. He said, if I'd been completely honest, would you have run? And I said, probably not. And he said, well, consider that a compliment. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you know, right. 16 years later, 15 yes. years later. So 
Have there been some fun parts? Not an adjective you hear very often around here. Oh, I think it's a lot of fun. I, I enjoy learning new things. I was one of those geeky kids that loved to read the newspaper and uh, read books. And so every day is different here. And there's a, such a wide range of, of issues that you can choose to work on. And the personalities are fascinating. The study of uh, what people are willing to do to get what they want, um, how they operate. I, I find it, I'm kind of a reality show junkie, and this is probably one of the best reality shows, if you will, <laughs> what happens up here. So I, I do think it's a lot of fun. That's a great comparison. Let's talk a little bit about you. In your time here, you have chaired House Transportation, Civil Law, Ways and Means. You're known for encouraging fiscal constraint and restraint. Did you ever find that it was hard to kind of marry your, that philosophy with your role as chair of any of these committees? I don't think so. I think uh, people approach chairmanships in different ways, and some have the top-down approach. I always try to uh, do a collaborative approach, and when we put together the budget facing the $6 billion deficit and uh, ended up with a budget with uh, the lowest increase in state spending in decades uh, here. That was a lot of work to develop consensus, but yeah, I believe you have to bring everybody kind of along in the process, figure out what they need, what they want, and uh, what you can do to make as much happen for everybody. You are known for that, for working across party lines, and when you announced you were going to retire, it was met by numerous tweets, Facebook postings, news releases by members of both parties expressing what a loss to the legislature it will be. What did that all mean to you, knowing that so many people were acknowledging your work here? It, well, it was very gratifying, um, and it's uh, in some ways kind of sad because I shouldn't be an exception. Um, it, it's kind of, in my mind, I think that, especially in the last four to six years, We've seen more and more partisanship, and um, I've chosen an area of data practices that's maybe easier to work bipartisanly. But I always had a mantra of that you could be, that you could disagree, but don't be disagreeable. And um, I learned early on that um, issues change and alliances change, and. Um, I was started out when Jesse Ventura was governor, so it was tripartisan government, and so my initial uh, kind of see how it's done had an ever-changing dynamic of two against one, whether it was the House and Senate against Governor Ventura or the Senate, and, and so I, I saw how that dynamic worked really loudly and clearly in my first term, which maybe set the stage uh, for that. You were saying off-camera that it's time. It's time to step mm -hmm. away. What what made you decide it is time? Well, I, I've had a, a great uh, time here. I love the people, but I've do, been doing it for 16 years. I'm 55 years old, almost. Um, if I was going to make a, a change, now is the time to do it. And it's time for somebody else to uh, have the opportunity, bring their skills uh, and talents. and. Um, I'd like to try something uh, different before I'm too old to. Like what? Any ideas? Well, I will be running for county commissioner. I have announced that I'm going to do that. The uh, district is the city of Lakeville. I've lived there since 1968. Um, I'm a Lakeville girl and uh, would like the opportunity um, to uh, try that uh, for something different. But I also want to look at um, working in some of the public policy arena around uh, privacy issues, empowering people to uh, know what government is uh, doing with their information, how they can protect themselves, their kids. Speaking of the data privacy issues, <clears throat> excuse me, we did have Speaker of the House Kurt Zellers in the studio here last week, and he said that you know, the NSA could learn a lot from you <laughs> and could learn a lot of policy. What is it about this issue that has you such a champion, and how do you Will you have any role in making sure somebody takes the ball and runs with it when you're no longer here? Well, I'll take the second half first. Okay. I did put in uh, legislation this year, which has now become law recently, that has enacted a data practices commission uh, 
tailored somewhat after the Pension Commission with a very baseline goal of trying to ex uh, develop more experts in the area here at the legislature. Uh, we make better policy when we have uh, more information and people um, collaborating on coming to resolution. Generally, it's a balance between privacy and public safety or privacy and public health. And so there's no real black or white or right or wrong a answers in this issue area. And so uh, expertise and information, I think, is important. Uh, but I, I believe that uh, government holds a lot of power over individuals and unchecked that can be dangerous and that to the degree that we give uh, information about ourselves to government and they don't aren't respectful of that, we actually lose freedoms and um, that's a big concern of mine. Anyway. And the, the adverse consequences too, kids being labeled, inaccurate information, um, it can have really bad consequences in people's lives as well. So no plans to work for the NSA? No. <laughs> Mary Liz Holberg, as always, thank you for coming in and My good pleasure. luck in your future endeavors. All right, thank you so much. Senator James Metzen caught up with us late in the week to talk a little bit about his omnibus liquor bill. It's a proposal that was at one time tabled in the Senate because of an addition of an amendment to allow for Sunday growler sales. His legislation ultimately passed without that provision. Senator Metzen says he's pleased with the work done on the package. It's a good bill. There's 24 provisions in there and it, with certain senators for their hometowns, they were asked to do it. Uh, the only thing, we didn't get the growlers this time, but that's just another day for that. But we got, I think, 18 senators had provisions in there uh, that they wanted. So I wanted to pass for those senators and our friends a bill, and that's what we did. What do you think of just the tone of PACE as well? Do you think it's been fairly uh, working across party lines? Do you think it's pretty acrimonious? How would you categorize it? Uh, somewhere in the middle. Certain issues, you know, are contentious, but... Uh, by and large, I think we're getting along a little bit better this year with Democrats and Republicans, and, and that's the good news. I mean, I've been trying to do that my entire political career, bring people together, get along, you know, get some middle ground, talk to one another, just not say it's my way or the highway. And uh, you know me well enough, and I've been trying to do this stuff over the years, and uh, that's the way to, I think, to govern, you know, and not just be hard-nosed on, you know, on a lot of things. And I think it's a little better this year. What grade would you give it? The grade, I, well, if we put these, we had a wonderful tax bill, the first, the big one. Uh, we're going to have a supplemental tax bill probably tomorrow that I think is real good. Uh, we repealed some taxes, as you know. We got a good bonding bill. Uh, we've done lots of good things for education. We paid back the $247 million, whatever it was, to, and uh, I think it's probably an A minus or an A. That concludes this week's program, but the activity here at the legislature is very fluid. You can be kept up to date by logging on to our website at senate.mn slash media. And again, that wraps up this week's show. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Bartke. Thanks for watching.